much. Beautiful, beautiful anthem. And I don't know where the slide went. Trish, thank you for that wonderful Back to the Future theme slide. I, I love that on my sermon series that we're looking at different uh, passages dealing with the future and we're going through Revelation and today uh, looking at a section, uh, section chapters 8 through 11, kind of a survey format. Looking not at details, but at major themes, and as I came to this passage this morning, I was reminded of an incident uh, recently with my family. Christy Beth and I were in Oklahoma City. We were driving down Council Road, and uh, we just happened to be underneath a tower that, that holds all of the sirens, I guess, of the storm warning alert sirens. Uh, we just happened to be underneath those at a time when they decided to test those. And that thing went off, and you talk about loud. Beth was going, what's happening? What's happening? She was covering her ears, and I said, well, Beth, look around. There's no tornado, <laughs> you know, coming right now. But they were sounding the alarm, testing the alarm. You know, throughout the centuries, there have been different ways that people have sounded alarms. I was in my car the other day, and all of a sudden, my phone started going crazy. And I opened it up, and it said, warning. I thought, what the heck is is this and then the man on the radio said something about a presidential alert test or a national cell phone <laughs> alert test I, I guess you know if the president needs to send me a text he can because uh, <laughs> they got my attention with that one but ways to sound the alarm ways to let us know when trouble is coming and historically, one of the ways that they did that in the ancient world was with the sounding of trumpets. And when we come to Revelation chapter 8, that's what we have is the successive sounding of trumpets, seven trumpets. We'll remember that uh, earlier in Revelation, chapter 4 to 7, we had seven seals. And the six seals were opened, and then there's silence in heaven. And they opened the seventh seal, and then all of a sudden there appeared seven trumpets. And I want to give you a little hint, if you're a student of Revelation, that if you look in chapter 7, verse 15, and chapter 11, uh, verse 15 and following, and chapter 15, verse 3 and following, and chapter 19, verse 1 and following, and if you want those references, I can give them to you after the service, what you're going to find is basically the same thing. That in all four of those passages, we have the pronouncement of the coming of the kingdom. And that should serve as a hint to us to realize that the different events that we have, the, the seven seals, and then the seven trumpets, and then we're going to have seven bowls of wrath, these are not sequential kind of events that are taking place. Because when you get to the seventh of each of those seals, trumpets, and bowls, they all end in the same place with the coming of the kingdom. What we have rather, instead of sequential events taking place, are parallel accounts, each taking a different segment of that period of history. Very much following the pattern which Jesus has shared with us, that throughout the history of the world there will be in general trials and tribulations and earthquakes, followed towards the end by an intense time of tribulation, followed by the glorious return of our Lord. And in Revelation 8 to 9, we have trumpets sounding, the warning of an intense time of tribulation coming. This is focusing on more of the end time in this parallel sequence of events. In the sounding of the first four trumpets, there's affliction upon nature. In trumpets 5 and 6, it's human suffering. Then that once again there's a kind of a silence in heaven and we go to the seventh trumpet and the cycle starts all over again. And whereas with the seals, the seals looked at the church from the perspective of our safety in Christ, through this period of trumpets, 8 through 11, the revelator writer looks at the church from the standpoint 
of our witness for Christ. Tribulations will come, afflictions will come, hardships will come, but in the midst of it all, the church is to shine as a light in a dark place. We are, as Jesus said, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and in the midst of trials and tribulation, the church is to be a vibrant witness for Christ. When we look at chapters 8 through 11, amidst the opening of the sounding of the trumpets, we have three primary images which tell us about what it means and how we as a church can be a faithful witness. The first is in the passage which Rick read for us this morning where it talks about chapter 8 that he saw in the midst of the sounding of these trumpets a golden censer, a big bowl. And it was a bowl that was mingled with incense, and mingled with the incense were the prayers of God's saints. And these prayers, like incense, were rising to heaven. And in all of the prayers, it says, the smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before the throne of the angel's hand. Now, as simple as it might be, as simple as it might sound, one of the ways that the church bears witness through times of trial is simply its faithfulness to the discipline of prayer, to reaching out to God in, in the voice of prayer, lifting up the concerns of others in the spirit of prayer, letting our prayers rise like incense to the throne of God. And it says that God continuously hears the prayers of his people and, and the world can see the church in response to the trials it faces, not in a state of panic, not in a state of confusion, not in a state of high anxiety, but in a disciplined effort of lifting up one another through times of prayers. It, it's... It's been encouraging to me, and I, I know it, it's kind of a common practice, as I visit different Sunday school classes, almost every one of our Sunday school classes, either at the beginning of the class or at the close of the class, says something like this, what are your joys and what are your concerns? How can we be praying for one another? We did that this morning in the Faith Links class, and, and a number of names were lifted up very specifically. And, and Judge April led the, the prayer this morning, very beautiful prayer. I was very moved by her prayer this morning as name by name she lifted up and prayed for those who had been lifted up. And I know that that experience is taking place uh, throughout every class in this church. And even later this morning, we're going to have a time and we're going to bring a joy jar down and people can share their joys, but we're, we're also going to have an time when... When someone is hurting, someone is afflicted, someone is suffering, we can lift up by name. And, and there's a list on the back of our bulletin, and some will add to it and write names down. And I know that this congregation is faithful in going home and praying for the people who are on that list and others whom God is laying on our mind and our heart. The other night we had our chili cook-off, or I guess it wasn't a cook-off, it was kind of a cook-off, it wasn't a contest, but our, our annual chili event in the park. And one of the things that we set up there at the park, and Pat Graham was sitting there with, with Randy Ogletree, and, it, and the sign on it said, Free Prayer. And uh, I looked over, and sometimes there are just people talking, but I, but I looked over one specifically time, and there was Pat Graham. In, in intense prayer with an individual who'd come to share with him and lift up his need and, and to know that we are a people of God who can be present in a park and can bring on some occasions hot dogs and hamburgers, on other occasions a bowl of chili. But if there's a need, if there's a hurt, if there's a concern, that we are open to lifting up and making this a gift to the community that we will be in prayer for people. When we have our... <clears throat> our uh, trunk or treat that table will be set up as well and when we do our pumpkin patch there will be a card on the tables of the pumpkin patch not that anyone's forced to put anything down but if someone has a need and they want to write in would your church be praying for me we're going to we're going to put these either to a class or send those cards to different people so that the prayers of the community can be lifted up and i know it sounds kind of simple <clears throat> but we look in revelations 8 9 
10 and 11 where the trumpet is sounding and it's a sound of warning of difficulties coming to the earth and in the midst of these trials and difficulties with the watching world one of the things that the watching world can see and one of the things from which the members of the church can take comfort is that the people of God historically have been people who have lifted up the prayer needs of those within their membership and those of the community. And it's one of the ways we bear witness to our faith that there is a God who is greater than the challenges and the afflictions and the difficulties which we face. When we go on in these chapters, 8 and 9 talks about basically the sounding of the trumpets and the different kind of afflictions. But then we come to chapter 10. And then it talks about a scroll. It has a, an image. He sees a, a little scroll being handed down. And, and, and the prophet is asked to take this scroll and actually to eat of this scroll. And as he eats of it, all of a sudden he notices something. That the taste in his mouth is both sweet and bitter. And it goes on to describe this scroll, and, 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 and it becomes very, very clear that what this scroll is representing and what this scroll is telling us about has to do with that very faithful word of God which has been entrusted to the apostles and now to the church. And, and implicitly within that gospel, this message of salvation through Christ. And, and so it says in verse 9, I, I, I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll, and he said to me, take it, eat it. It will turn in your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was turned sour. And then he says, I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. It's very clear this little scroll is just symbolic of this book of revelation to which the church has has been given God's special word and, and, and contained within this is the central theme of the gospel and the, and the blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and it's almost like uh, that John was being commissioned once again and we as a church are being commissioned once again to be faithful to this news, to be faithful to this word to be faithful to this gospel of Jesus Christ. And we bear our witness to the world not by trying to figure out what the world thinks and then saying we need to think that too. Not by looking to what the world does and saying we need to imitate that too. And that happens in in many ways, I've already shared with you my frustration a few years ago when corporate America was, was all caught up in strategic planning and, and somewhere leaders in the Methodist church said, every church must have a strategic plan as well. I think that's a good idea and it became required for every church to have a strategic plan. That's, that was the buzzword that was going on in corporate America and it filtered down into the and, and what the apostle is saying, no, don't, don't think so much about what the world's doing, what the world's thinking, what the world's practicing but be faithful to this word that God has given to you and the fact of the matter is when we look at this message of the gospel it is both bitter and sweet historically it always has been it's bitter because contained within this message of the gospel is the announcement that that we have sinned we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and each and every one of us needs to confess our sins and repent of our sins and give our life to Christ and and contained within that message of the gospel is that reality that there are consequences for disobeying God there are consequences for living a life that that is not in keeping with God's word but within that gospel also is the sweetness of the hope of salvation that no matter what we have done no matter how deep our transgression, no matter the seriousness of, of our sin and turning from God, that God can forgive us, God can heal us, God can restore us, God can bring us back into relationship with Him. And you know the, the problem is historically, the church has had tendency to kind of veer in one or two directions of this gospel that really needs to be maintained in balance. 
We've either wanted to soften the gospel and focus on the sweetness and oh, the blessings of salvation and, and God's grace just, you know, exceeds all and, and I'm okay and you're okay and it doesn't really matter what you've done. Just the, the great blessings of the gospel and don't, don't worry about, about sin or anything like that or maybe how we've, we've forsaken God. Just forget about that. Just, it's just the blessings of the gospel. And then at other times in history and in some other churches, they've forgotten about the hope and the redemptive story of the gospel and everything's about judgment and everything's harsh and hardness. It kind of reminds me, if you've ever seen the movie Pollyanna, and that little girl, is it, is it Haley? And she's, and she's in that church. If you've ever seen, you ought to go back and see that scene and that, and that minister is up pounding away that message of sin and, and damnation and he's doing it so so uh, vigorously that even the the chandeliers are trembling and shaking in the church and and this little girl's eyes are about this minute oh my gosh it's like hell and damnation are going to come down upon us you know here any minute there's no no light of hope no glimmer of the gospel no sounding the note of grace it's just it's just all negative but but what the angel says is when we take this scroll and we eat it and we internalize it we have to keep together these themes that yes there is a hard confrontation that we need to repent of our sins and give our lives to God but there is a glorious sweetness to the fact that God is merciful and loving and forgiving and wants to bring his children into his fold and and to restore us and heal us in wonderful wonderful ways and how does the church bear witness to the world we bear witness to the world in the midst of great tribulation by being faithful and trusting of God and lifting up our prayers and we bear witness by keeping the balance of the gospel not by backing off on the fact that that God is calling us to change and give our lives to him and repent of our sins but always lifting up this great hope that your life can be renewed our life can be changed our life can be transformed by the marvelous uh, measures and, and resources of God's love. And then we go on in chapter 11. And there's one other kind of sign that's lifted up in this passage of these trumpets that are sounding the warning to the world that difficult times are coming. And this one's a little bit more of a challenge to interpret, but I'm going to make a run at it today. And you all can go home and get your commentaries. And if your commentary says something different, then what I'm going to say, that's okay, because I think the big point, the main point, is really going to be the same. It's a story about two witnesses. Two witnesses that appear in the midst of, of great tribulation. People have, have historically tried to identify these. Some look to the Old Testament and say it's Moses and Elijah, and it's two historical figures who come back to life and come to earth. I, I, you know, I don't personally prescribe to that, but, but some will, will go on and, and make argument for that, and that's fine. Others see two modern witnesses yet to be identified, two figures that will arise in the brink of history to, to bring witness to the world. And yet, one of the clues to me is that, that when you get looking at this passage, all of a sudden the two witnesses actually become two lampstands. And they actually become two olive branches. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of earth. Now when you think about that, about the two olive trees, it's a clear reference to the faithful people within the Hebrew community, the faithful Israelites of the Old Testament. When you look to the two lampstands, it's clearly a reference to Revelation chapter 1 where we have the, the image of the lampstands for the, for the churches of Asia Minor and talking about the, the emergence of the Gentile church. And now here these two are brought together, the two olive trees, uh, reference to the, the saints of the Old Testament and the lampstands, I believe a reference to the to the saints of the New Testament and you put those together and it's talking about the redeemed, the faithful remnant of Israel gathered with the Gentile community that comes in and accepts Christ and becomes a mighty vibrant church and witness for God and that's exactly in the book of Acts what we saw was the remnant of Israel uh, receiving the Messiah and then the, the outreach of, of the mission to the Gentiles and the Gentile coming together and 
And so in my mind, it's this missionary church, these two witnesses, the faithful of the Israelite community and, and those who are the Gentile uh, converts coming together. And, and, and however you interpret this, and again, if you go home and get your commentary and say, Pastor Allen didn't get it quite right, uh, that's fine. Come and see me. I've got seven commentaries on Revelation in my shelf, and they all have a different idea. And I can give you even more to think about, and that's and that's okay. But the key, I think, is in verse seven. It says, "When they finish their testimony, the key here is whoever these people are. They're witnesses. They're sharing their testimony. They're sharing their testimony to the very end." They do not become slack in, in preaching this gospel that has been entrusted for them. They do not become slack or hesitant in lifting up their testimony. In fact, even when they're finally taken up to heaven in, in martyrdom, it says they stand before the throne and they share their testimony before the Lamb. Their testimony is on their lips and on their mouth. And, and it causes us to give pause and in, in, in a day which brings affliction and trial to the church, are we faithful in sharing what God has done for us? Are we consistent in lifting up our testimony before a watching world? I'm going to share a little bit of a complaint today, and, and I've, I've shared this with others and leaders of our denomination, so it's, it's not a secret. One of the things we do every year in, in the life of the church, starting uh, three or four years ago, was leaders of our church are presented with a thing which is called the church life cycle. And in this church life cycle, it starts with the church is born, like the church is just, you know, getting started and and, and kind of developing, and then, then the church is starting to grow, and then the church is developing and maturing, and then the church reaches its peak and the, of its influence, but, but then people start dying and moving away, and the church is waning in its power, and then the church is just maintaining, and then the church is just trying to preserve itself, and then the church dies. And, and we are asked as a congregation to reflect upon the church life cycle and to decide where in this life cycle we are. And I look at that and I think for 2,000 years, that is not the way the church has gone. It's not. Yes, some churches do surely go through a life cycle, but a church, the church of the living God is not an individual. Now, if we want to talk about the life cycle of an individual, we can talk about childhood and adolescence and young adulthood and middle years. And then we're beginning to age and then we're growing older and and unless and, and we're translated up to heaven, yes, there's going to come a, part, a point in which we die. I mean, that is a human life cycle for human beings. But I look at the church for over 2,000 years, and that has not been the history nor the message of the church. And it's not the message which our church or the Methodist church should be conveying or focusing on today? I don't think, because throughout the history of the church, what we find are rapid periods of growth followed by persecution, and at times when the church is vanished and scattered and separated, followed by renewal and revival and the church on the move once again, followed by times of, of affliction and immorality sometimes, and the church on the wane, and then, and then a, a, an outpouring of the Spirit and the church on the growth and the move again, the church is more like riding a roller coaster than going through a life cycle. And when I look at this, and I look at this passage, and, and there's the sounding of the trumpets, and with every sounding of the trumpets, there's a, a, an intense, a more intense warning that Nature's afflicted. Now human. Now there's human suffering. Now there's affliction throughout the world. Now, now there's all kinds of troubles taking place. And we just look around our world today, and if we want to see the trumpet and hear the trumpet being sounded as we watch our, our nightly news, we can certainly hear it being sounded. But the message for the church is, this is an opportunity for the church to be the church. Let, 
Let the church be the church. Let it be faithful in its prayers to God. Let, let the church be the church and, and hold firm to the purity and the blessings of the gospel. Let the church be the church and let us always go forth. Let us be those two witnesses. Let us join together with a friend and go out as Jesus sent them two by two into all of the world. And when you look at this passage and the resounding of of you must prophesy again many peoples, many nations, many languages, kings in all places, there are people that need to hear this good news. Let us go out two by two and be the church. And let us tell our story. Let us be faithful to to the message that God has given us. Let us let us be faithful witnesses knowing that God is going to bless us and and renew us and in due time revive and even resurrect us. Thanks be to God. I'll close with this thought. I guess it's about two years ago, we were looking at the book of Acts. And when we were looking at that series, I looked at the opening chapters of the books of Acts and I preached a message called the threefold cord. Remember that? And I said, there's always been a threefold cord that's the key to church growth, which are the prayers of God's people, the power of the Holy Spirit, which always leads to faithfulness to the gospel, and lifting up in personal testimony the witness, our personal witness to Jesus. And I was looking here in Revelation 8 through 11 and looking through this passage and the witness of the church, and I thought, my goodness, here it is again. From the very opening stages of the church and the books of Acts and now pointing to a time who knows when it'll come to the final days when when tribulation and difficulties are real here it is again the people of God lifting up their prayers and the power of the Spirit being faithful to their witness and to the good news that's been entrusted to us and lifting up the name of Jesus and sharing in their witness No matter what the world may be doing, no matter what segments of the church may be doing, I believe today and tomorrow and for years to come, the opportunity is before us. That we might stay true to God's word, that we might hold on to his promise, that we might be his faithful witnesses, sharing the power of his presence in our life and in our community. Thanks be to God. Amen.